California. Oakland, <laughs> California. <laughs> but it feels like downtown California. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're sharing the space with the other well-known podcast, <laughs> podcaster of note, 99% Invisible, which is also brought to you from Oakland, California. Um, we're just getting settled in. We're enjoying the warm weather. And we want to invite you to join our Monday morning class. The title of this class is going to be, It's About Drive, It's About Power, We Stay Hungry, We Devour, which Jenlene is looking at me cluelessly. I have no idea what this is in reference to. Jenlene is not a denizen of the TikTok <laughs> Cir circle of hell it's of self-referential <laughs> musical true. loops um but this is a reference to the to the song the rap song that was released by noted rap artist and actor the rock <laughs> dwayne johnson and it's been a sound on tiktok that that's been going around for a while um and we're going to talk about that what the philosophy of the rock song is today <laughs> um and it's about drive, it's about power, we stay hungry, we devour. And we're going to talk about that. Um, if you're joining us for the very first time today, welcome. Yes. Welcome to our learning community. <laughs> um, about a year and a half ago, Jenlene and I were living in London, in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And we're working as educators. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenlene worked at the University of London. Mm -hmm. And I worked at the University of Oxford Brooks. Sort of the retarded stepchild to... <laughs> the Oxford University. Um, and now we are in the United States and uh, teaching classes from our car, which if Oxford Brooks is the lesser version of Oxford University, <laughs> then this is truly the like, gone off the rails into, I don't know, perpetually going off the rails that's the whole point of a car is that you don't have to stay You're on the rails I that's, like, a, that's its appeal I like you can idea. take it to California you can say it's too cold we're like the magic school bus of philosophy <laughs> so get in strap yourselves in yes um, if you're a beginner if you're an expert if you're joining us no matter where you're from well, hello and welcome if you're joining us for the very first time please stick around for a while this is a weekly introduction to philosophy and theory series where we lay out some of the key concepts within continental theory mm -hmm. and relate them to pop culture ideas that are hopefully accessible and intuitive to you. Um, you can join for free. Every class is open access, 100% available to anybody anywhere. In fact, if you're watching this and you are not in California... <laughs> we already have students saying that they are joining us from India and Egypt. And let us know where you're joining us from. Sunny or chilly place. That's amazing. Yes, please do leave us a comment telling us where you're joining us from. Mm -hmm. That makes us very, very happy. Mm -hmm. Big sip. I'm going to take a big <laughs> sip before we start. <laughs> yeah, um, go for it. Yeah, it's always pretty wild when people tell us where they're joining us from. It's hard to imagine. Uh, hello from Poland, says someone. Uh, Poland, India, Germany, wonderful. Texas, that's <laughs> not too far. We, we read in the newspaper yesterday, there was a column that said, is Texas oh. the new California? And I feel like some people's brain short-circuited. <laughs> Mine. Mine. Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things, but I just want to say briefly that you are invited to join this class for free. Mm -hmm. um, and if you'd like to support these classes, if you'd like to help us keep them free, please consider becoming a patron. Uh, you can find the link in our Instagram bio, in our YouTube bio. Plus, we have a pretty big announcement. This is my sound for announcement. Uh, on December 1st, I'm gonna be releasing the audiobook for The Hermeneutic Temptation, which is my ebook. I'm gonna release a chapter every single week, and uh, the first chapter is coming December 1st. If you're already a top tier patron, if you've already downloaded the book, you're simply going to be getting the audiobook for free. That's going to be a bonus on top of what you've already signed up for. Um, and if you're a masterclass patron, if you're in tier three on Patreon, I've decided to make all of the transcripts for every class, edited transcripts, available to the masterclass patrons so that everybody gets a little bit <laughs> that way we, we like to sort of keep everybody feeling like they're they're yes. getting getting a lot of bangs for their bucks <laughs> as americans like to say okay i think we should just jump right in uh Jenlene, feel free to just interrupt or derail or contribute <laughs> in any fashion you please um Jenlene is currently working on her doctorate which means that Jenalene is just kind of vibing with us while she's also thinking about more important things. This is how I de-stress. 
Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is my one hour of relaxation. Okay, so let's just jump right in. Um, last week, we talked a lot about love and about love as requiring a certain formal decision. At what point do you decide to act on your love? At what point do you decide that you're going to be in a relationship? Of course, if you decide to act on your love and you confess your feelings to another person, there's always a chance that they're not going to feel the same way, <laughs> in which case you have unrequited love, which is probably one of the worst experiences in the world. <laughs> and it's, it's important to note that last week I was talking a lot about this idea of retroactive formalization and we're linking it to Hegel, and specifically to Badiou's theory of the avenge. Remember, the philosopher Alain Badiou says that love is a truth process, because in the process of being in love, you find yourself, you find your true self, even though it's experienced as a loss of self. And what I failed to mention last week is that Zizek would agree, but only to a certain degree. Zizek would agree that love is traumatic, in that sense, that love shatters your illusion of what your life was before you fell in love. Where Zizek would disagree is that love, as Bajia calls it, is a localization of a void. In other words, Zizek would say that love isn't about seeing an event, a void, and you leap into it. Mm -hmm. Instead, Zizek would say it's a void that exists already inside of you. In other words, you could have love that only exists because it resists being formally integrated into love. I'll give you an example. Mm. The whole point of having an affair is that it's illicit. What makes the affair desirable isn't that the person you're having an affair with seems like a particularly good lifelong partner. <laughs> and this is also why a lot of affairs break down at the point where you say... <laughs> where they become formalized. Where they become formalized. Where you say, well, mm -hmm. leave your partner for me and now you will be my partner. Mm -hmm. Because the problem of the affair, I don't know if there's any like secret information to share, but the problem of the affair is that the affair exists as the thing that make that is like the exception to the marriage or the partnership. Mm -hmm. As soon as you turn the affair into a partnership, then in a weird way, it's no longer an affair. Plus, you're more likely to have another affair. <laughs> and so the question is, how do you sustain the affair? And of course... For Zizek, the only way that you would sustain the affair would be by sustaining the relationship that the affair is a deviation from. Mm -hmm. so we're already within a Lacanian universe here where fantasy sustains reality. It's also why Zizek has always said that, and I did a clip about this recently, the Freudian question is never to say, why is everything secretly about sex? The Freudian question is to say, what is sex about? Mm -hmm. And this is an inversion that is really important if you want to understand Zizek's critique of ideology. And that's what we're going to lay out in the following 50 minutes in this class. It's going to be a one-hour class. Um, and so you've probably heard the expression, everything is about sex except sex itself. Sex is about power. I think that's attributed to Oscar Wilde, but I'm not sure if that oh, he was the first one who said it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I like to attribute it to Janelle Monae because she sings it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Janelle Monae has it in a song. Level. <laughs> yeah, which is actually better. Yeah, let's attribute it to Janelle Monae. I think that's actually perfectly, perfectly correct. Um, and so what happens with the idea of everything is about sex except sex itself is that what Freud is interested in is he's not interested in saying everything is a symbol of sex or sexuality. Mm -hmm. It's not about identifying phallic objects in the world. Instead, what Freud is interested in is the thing that remains unrepresentizable by sex. In other words, if everything is a symbol of sex, if everything is a stand-in for sex, then this presents a problem, which is how can sex be a stand-in of itself? What supplements sex, if not sex? Yeah, you were going to well, say? Well, and I think you had a great parallel to that in previous weeks when you were talking about historical materialism and Marxism, which was to say... For Marx, if everything is about money, then the question is, what is money about? Yeah. What is capital about? Yeah. Yeah, the joke is to say, if everything is about money, then what is money about? Money is about exploitation, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but to be more honest, mm -hmm. to, to make it less polemical, we're already back at the rock song, which is, if everything is about money, then what is money about? Money is about drive, money is about <laughs> hunger, we say blah, 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 you know what I mean? 
So there's this empty core, which mm -hmm. is a core of repetition. And the Freudian term for this is Wiederholungszwang, uh, which is the compulsion to repeat. Of course, on a vulgar sense, you could say that having sex is a compulsion to repeat. After all, from like a purely, <laughs> from a purely like mechanical perspective, it's very hard to have love without Wiederholungszwang. <laughs> Unless you're like very efficient. Is that too rude? <laughs> no, because he said it in German. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so what's important here is let's lay this out a little bit more. Um, in, the, in the song from The Rock, which is the, um, it's about drive, it's about power, we stay hungry, we devour. Yes? The key word here is drive. Because here we're already talking about Freudian drive. And the difference between desire and drive, which can be very easily understood. Desire is the desire for a lost object. Like, I'm going to show off my travel mug here. It's wonderful. And if someone takes it away, <laughs> I will be sad. And I will say something like, I desire this object that is now lost. Drive isn't the desire for a lost object. Does a drive is loss as object. In other words, the thing I want isn't the thing that was lost. The thing I want is loss itself. This is actually, again, when you look at the rock song, I'm, I'm going to keep saying this. It's about drive, it's about power, we say hungry, we devour. In the rock song, he's actually not selling you a product. That's the funny thing. Usually when the rock talks, it's about watch my movie, buy my protein powder, do, do something mm -hmm. which I am selling you. He's essentially a very effective and extremely charismatic salesperson. However, in the song, of course you could say the song is being sold to you, but the song is about what The Rock symbolizes. In other words, the brand of The Rock isn't you should buy this. The brand of The Rock is I go to the gym every day, I'm always a hard worker, and I'm not making fun of this, this is like good good things to do. I'm persistent. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking to be more successful and a better man, etc. Right? So there's an ethos which we could call like the rock work ethic, which he embodies. And that's what the song is about. Drive is that. Yeah. Desire is I want the thing. And once I have the thing, presumably I might be happy. Drive is I actually don't care about the thing. I just want the process of wanting itself. And that's why Drive for Freud is about repetition. If you go to The Rock's social media pages, you will see the perfect definition of the Freudian Wiederholungszwang, which is that every single day, it's usually a picture of his head in a gym saying, this is the grind, this is why we work, we're doing it. And you never really know what it's for because it's that with a promotion to a movie or a trip. And then you see him on a plane, and then you see him on the tarmac, and then in the gym, on the tarmac, in the gym, on the tarmac. And the thing is, this is probably a highly satisfying life. And The Rock has been very open about mental health struggles and struggling with depression. And drive in that weird way sustains you because it's not for a formal X. It's simply the process of wanting itself. It's the process of pursuit itself. In other words, we have here what you might call purpose. Of course, purpose is already ideologically informed. Drive resists purpose. As soon as drive becomes formalized into purpose, it's no longer really drive anymore. We're already skating close towards something more ideological there. You were mm -hmm. going to say something? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sometimes I'm like, blah, 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 and I feel like I hear you in the corner of my... I... No, I'm with you. So let's go back to the idea of the affair mm. for a moment. If the affair is a form of drive here, the affair is, in a sense, saying everything that I, that I can't get in my relationship, I can get in the affair. In other words, my relationship provides me with stability, happiness, security, comfort. I don't know. This is what I cannot find in an affair. Now, the mistake here is to think that a lot of people have an affair because their relationship isn't very good. The painful reality is that an affair becomes almost more enticing the better your relationship is. Mm -hmm. There's almost like a self-destructive urge there. And... Ironically, like I said before, if you try to turn the affair into a relationship, you lose the affair. Now, there's two examples that I think are quite interesting here. Um, the director, Sam Mendes, basically made a sequel 
to the film Titanic, which was an adaptation of the of the novel um, Revolutionary Road. Oh yes. Do you remember That's that a good example? It's yeah. quite a long time ago, probably mm-hmm. like twenty years ago. Mm-hmm. With who are the actors? Uh, Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. But you know, I didn't watch it. I read the book. It's basically like a like. Imagine that Titanic had ended as a happy ending. Yes. And Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio had ended up in a middle class 1950s existence well, I think that's and, a really, and destroyed each other. I think that's a really, really <laughs> important point because you could say that, I mean, Titanic very much is about an affair, even though neither of them are. I suppose she's engaged, isn't she? Neither of them are really, neither of them are married, right? No. But they're committed each committed to the idea of their sort of social standing and their position in society and their it depends very much yeah. on what your reading of the movie is. Yeah, okay. Zizek has a relatively well-known reading of the movie where he essentially posits that Leonardo DiCaprio is a vanishing mediator for Kate Winslet's surplus enjoyment. <laughs> in other words, what Kate Winslet enjoys isn't actually the relationship. What she enjoys is flirting with someone of a lower status who then conveniently disappears by the end of the movie <laughs> so she can have the ultimate romantic break with that character. Yes. Because what she really doesn't want is to marry somebody who's from below decks. But there's more, there's more like obscene imagery in, um, in Titanic. For example, uh, there's a scene in which like the lower class people are like dancing. They're mm-hmm. having like mm-hmm. big like revelry mm-hmm. underneath the ship's deck. Mm-hmm. And above it's all table manners, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. et cetera. Which brings us back to two things. One, last week we talked about Susan Zontag's observation that the fork is the reel of the cutlery set. Mm -hmm. In other words, that eating once upon a time was simply about the consumption of food. Then we realize that there's a surplus enjoyment to be had, which is the process of enjoying social relations, which require food. Everybody who's had a dinner party knows exactly how this works. When you have a dinner party, it's stressful. You have to put together all these things. There's a lot of cleaning. While you're at Thanksgiving, you're worried about who's going to say what. Is your crazy uncle going to start talking about <laughs> how fascism wasn't all that bad, etc.? All of that, the entire social experience, has nothing to do with the food. Mm-hmm. The food is a vanishing mediator for the social gathering as such. And so what Susan Zontag says is that the fork, being the object that distances us from the food, is also the symbol of the socialization process. In other words, the fork is the quote-unquote Lacanian reel of the cutlery set because cutlery is supposed to make us access food easier, and yet the fork represents the fact that the food only serves as a, a symbol around which we've created what we really enjoy, surplus enjoyment, mm-hmm. of all of this social nonsense that we've created around it. Yeah, if anyone has childhood memories of trying to eat, like, bits of vegetable or something when you're really really hungry and being told to slow down and the fork feels like the thing that will slow you down when you're really hungry yeah like if you really just want to nourish yourself you just sort of stuff your face basically and so what's important here is that when i say surplus enjoyment is that we're enjoying something which seems to be its formal opposite in other words we're enjoying not just the consumption of food in its most direct form, we're actually enjoying something that limits us from consuming food, which is having to make conversation, being polite to other people. Of course, the dark side of this is that surplus enjoyment can actually be not just enjoying something opposite, but actually enjoying your own pain. In other words, part of the enjoyment of a dinner party is being able to go home afterwards and say, oh my God, (laughs) can you believe X said Mm so-and-so? Mm-hmm. I remember when I was a child, I once confronted my parents. We'd gone to a dinner party and with my parents' best friends. And we were on the drive home, and my parents were just talking shit about their best friends. And I remember being home and being really mad and saying to my parents, you said those were your best friends, <laughs> and instead you're just saying all these mean things about them behind mm-hmm. their back. How can they be your best friends? And what I didn't, what I failed to understand back then is that... <laughs> If they weren't your best friends, you wouldn't even eat with them. And so in a weird way, the enjoyment is having not somebody you would never talk behind your back to, but someone you can comfortably talk behind your back to. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think it's really important that you point out that the surplus enjoyment is very much about the perceived opposite. And so with the example of the affair versus the stability, it's like the, 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 
um, the predictability versus like the improvisation or the the unplannedness of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that like, sort of tension, like creative limitations. Exactly. Yeah. For example, if you look at um, Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill's um, uh, comic operatic masterpiece, the Threepenny Opera, Drei Groschen Oper, the famous song. The Mac the Knife song was actually composed right before the first performance <laughs> when half of the performing artists yes. had decided to spontaneously quit. <laughs> and so Kurt Weill, knowing that they'd invested a lot of money into a performance that now was not going to be able to work, sat down at the piano and wrote and improvised the famous Mac the Knife. Can you do Mac the Knife? I first? cannot do Mac the Knife. I'm not going to do it justice. Uh, that's Sorry. I we could do it. So yes, there's something as like a creative limitation. That's that's very true. You well, it'll be much. it'll be on YouTube. There's much better. Find a Lotelinia performance of it on YouTube. I'm gonna do it, but I'm just gonna <laughs> screw it up. So it's not gonna. Can you prompt me? I always need the first note. <laughs> um, I don't think so. We can't remember how it goes. Is that it? Da, 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 da. Okay. <laughs> That's really good. Actually, I'm going to stand with that. <laughs> you led me to the brink. I'm like, I'm musically not very confident. We've already established this. Um, it's funny, there's a clip that I posted the other day on TikTok where Zizek says that he is incapable of singing or dancing, like psychologically incapable of it. And part of this is Zizek's theory of the obscene master. So, what is obscene? Obscene is when you are demonstrating your power by flaunting something that you are bad at. So for example, let's go back to the dinner party. If you invite a bunch of guests and they arrive for your dinner party and you make them really disgusting food, that would be obscene. Why? Because you've taken the power of being the host and you force other people into a situation in which they eat something which mm -hmm. is objectively disgusting and go, hmm, yeah, this is so wonderful. <laughs> the best example of this is if you look at the uh, Return of the King movie from The Lord of the Rings. The bonding scene between um, Aragorn and uh, who's the unrequited lover of Eowyn. Yes. Eowyn makes him or, like a rabbit stew or something. There's like even hair in it, like and stuff, and and he's sort of politely sipping it, right? He's like, "Mmm, this is so delicious," but actually, as soon as she looks away, he like dumps it out, basically, right? And burns his hand. It's a great scene. It's yeah. a great scene, and what's beautiful about this is that if they were just being polite, there would be no character development mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. The beauty of it is precisely that, in a sense, like he doesn't, he cannot fully do it. He, yeah. Like it's. They're so incompatible. <laughs> it's very nice. Okay, so let's go back to the idea of the affair and the idea of surplus enjoyment. So we have here Titanic versus Revolutionary Road. And Revolutionary Road is basically staging what would have happened if um, Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet had actually become a couple. 1950s nuclear family. Depressed, fighting, mm -hmm. etc. Um, but it, like a classical um, equivalent of this would be um, Orpheus and Eurydice. <laughs> Because, look at it like this. In the Orpheus and Eurydice myth, mm -hmm. Orpheus goes back to fetch, to retrieve Eurydice from hell, essentially. I mean, it's not hell, but it's Hades at this point. Whatever. The H place. <laughs> Sorry. The underworld. And the underworld. And the rule is that if Euripides, that's his name, right? Am I getting Orpheus. it? Orpheus. Sorry, if Orpheus, I don't know why I said Euripides, if Orpheus looks back at Eurydice, like this, she will be dragged back into hell. And, of course, inevitably, Orpheus looks back, Eurydice is dragged back. There's a couple of ways to read this story. One of these sort of, like, quote-unquote modern readings of it is to say, well, maybe Orpheus realized that he didn't want to end up like Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio in the Revolutionary Road. Maybe he realized that even if he saved her, they would just have to then suddenly be partners rather than these mythic. And so maybe in a weird way, he wanted to contribute to the, his own legend and decided to sacrifice her. Mm -hmm. Another modern and somewhat cynical reading is that maybe she had the same realization. Maybe she realized that the best thing that she could do to make Orpheus into a legendary artist not just another guy on Spotify, but like the guy who will still have his song streamed 2,000 years later, yeah. is to deny him the reconciliation. 
to, to be his muse in that sense. Um, of course, an even more cynical reading would be to say, well, maybe Oridice simply had already started walking back because she realized she didn't want to be with this guy. <laughs> he looks around, it's sees like, her walking where back, did you go? says, come back. <laughs> and she says, screw you. I don't want to come back. And then Orpheus with his head, with his legs, with the tail between his legs, goes back to the world of the living and they say, where's Eurydice? Why didn't she come with you? And he's like, well, there was a curse. And because there was a curse, she couldn't come with me. <laughs> like, <laughs> to disavow the fact that she didn't want to come with him. That's, I think, the underlying truth of this story, right? <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's sort of always how I tend to look at it. Okay, well, this actually brings us, so the ambiguity that we have here is important, mm -hmm. which brings us to another beautiful ambiguity. Um, and it's the ambiguity of the word utopia. Now, there's two ways to look at the word utopia, sort of a correct way and a wrong way. And I realized until recently that I had it the wrong way, which is I always thought of utopia as being a place of the good. In other words, EU, U meaning good, like euphoric or Europe or euthanasia, a good death. No, I mean, that's yeah, yeah. the word. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about that, but yes, you're Thank right. You. <laughs> euthanasia simply means a good death. Mm -hmm. Thanos death. Mm -hmm. I mean, Thanatos death and yeah. then you good. Um, However, utopia isn't a good place. Of course, the show The Good Place is, mm -hmm. a, is a pun on this as well. Utopia is specifically a not place or a non-place. The U stands for not. Mm -hmm. It's almost like in Turkish, I think you explained this to mm -hmm. me, you can add something that makes it not. Mm -hmm. Was it deil? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a place of deil. It's a not place. Now, what this means isn't that it's a place that doesn't yet exist or that it's a place that doesn't exist. More importantly, a utopia is a place whose existence is, in a sense, non-localizable. In other words, if we go back to Bajou's idea of a localization of a void, when he says that love is a truth process, is a localization of a void, that's the utopian element of love. Mm -hmm. It's specifically the thing that cannot be localized. In other words, it is a place of no place, which has a similarity to what it, the post-Marxists would later call the part of no part. What is the thing that is necessarily excluded that contains the truth? Or for Lacan, the real, the fork contains the truth of the cutlery set, which is that it's not just about eating more efficiently, it's about the social relations around the consumption of food. And so utopia, is in a sense the localization of that principle that we see both in Marx and within psychoanalysis. It's the thing that cannot be represented, nevertheless has to be represented as its own failure. Mm -hmm. In other words, utopia, rather than being presented as a successful system of the perfect virtuous way of life, utopia is simply a sign for something which cannot be signified. It is the representation of that which cannot yet be thought. That is utopia. And in a weird way, if you move into that space, you've already filled it in. It's no longer quite utopian. Now, instead of thinking of utopia as a place on the map, you have to see utopia as this, as a sign for that which resists symbolization, mm -hmm. which means that within all politics, there is a utopian element. What is that utopian element? It's the fact that politics, in a weird way, only exists because we cannot agree on the fundamental terms of politics. Let me put that a little bit more clearly, because I know this is like... Let's say that we could agree on the fundamental parameters of politics. We could agree on what justice is. We could agree on what freedom is. We could agree, we could agree on what equality is. We could agree on what liberty is. We could agree even on what poverty is. If we could agree what the definition of these things are, we would have no need for politics. In fact, politics is precisely the process by which we, in a weird way, hash out these disagreements and try to fill them in. If you ask a leftist 
what they think freedom is, you will have a very different answer from what someone on the right will say freedom is. There's a good example of this in the town we came from, Spokane, mm -hmm. where there's a there's a, a street downtown Spokane that has two stores. And one store is a plant shop called Fern. Shout out to Fern. <laughs> and you go inside and it's like stereotypical lefty liberal consumer society. Scandy design. Scandy design, white Higa, white walls, jazz, or like, or, or <laughs> like, I don't know, like meditation music. <laughs> Everyone wears Birkenstock. Um, very gender fluid, Black Lives Matter signs, etc. Next to that store, and by next to, I don't mean down the street. I mean, like, two feet mm -hmm. next door, is another store that is the exact opposite of that, except for gun rights, for, um, what's the flag for the, I forget what it's called in America. Like the don't tread on me flag. Yeah, yeah but the mm. union flag, is that what it's called? Mm. What do you call it here? The confederate flag. Confederate flag, thank you. The confederate flag, lots of posters saying, like, this is freedom in America, et cetera, et cetera. And what's important to note here is it's not the, it's not the pendulum theory. It's not that you sort of have the choice between one or the other and that yeah. it kind of swings. One and that door or the other door. Yeah. You could imagine a centrist approaching these stores and doing essentially what Harry Potter's wizards do at platform nine three quarters. Is that it? Yeah. Which is platform nine three quarters means that you... You have to run towards the wall, mm -hmm. and then as if you're going to hit the wall, you hit the wall, <laughs> but then you go through the wall. Mm -hmm. In fact, at King's Cross Station in London, where very close to which you and I used to live, there's people posted to prevent people from rushing <laughs> headlong into the wall. Because, of course, there will be people who want to try this out. Of course, that's also the centrist position. The centrist position will see the two stores and simply run straight into the middle and dash open their skulls onto the wall. One of the things that Zizek has always argued is that the center isn't neutral. Well, there's also Tariq Ali's argument as well. The radical center? Yeah. Um, yeah, is that what his book is called? I think he wrote a book called that, but the radical I'm curious. Center. Yeah, yeah, it? no, no. And I think that, that, that um, part of his argument is to say this, it's in trying to find the center that we actually lose our way politically. Interesting. Yeah, that's a different argument, but okay. it is interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, we went to a Tariq Ali talk a while back, mm -hmm. which was sort of okay, but also not great. It was okay. It was okay. I think I have a little bit more skeptical about Tariq Ali. You know, we don't go to dinner parties. We just go to lectures of <laughs> authors we love. <laughs> and then, no, we don't say mean things about them, but I think that we, we say how we talk about how we feel about them. So we've been to... Let's have a very brief intermission where we do a brief list of name dropping of like leftist thinkers we've attended talks by and what we thought were notable notable parts. Yeah. No. Briefly. This is actually going to be fun. All right. What is your I'll ask you for your first response. So when you we went to see David Harvey mm -hmm. at the LSE, what was your what is the gut response? I really enjoyed it, but I think we both thought that he cussed quite a lot. He cussed a lot. <laughs> it was really weird. He was like this nice like geographer Marxist and for some reason that guy is like potty mouth and I didn't know if it was like if it was weird it's because he like speaks to the kids I don't yeah. know yeah well, this is what I was wondering is that how he talks when he goes to like the bakery <laughs> which I would admire it's like <laughs> like um uh what's his name sorry uh David Harvey goes mm -hmm. to the bakery he's like I like to have a fucking baguette with some God damn coffee, please. <laughs> or he just cussed a lot because he thought that's how the kids talk. It was a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. He cussed a lot. That was my first impression. Okay, Tariq Ali, mm -hmm. what was your impression? I really liked it. I thought it was really eloquent. But I felt like he said a lot of stuff that I sort of already agreed with. My, my take on Tariq Ali was that I remember he had a joke, which I thought was pretty good, about dinosaurs and why he's a dinosaur. That was oh, pretty that good. That was pretty good. Do you remember the yes, joke? Yes, because he'd been insulted in the press for being a dinosaur. 
and he said, you know, dinosaurs are actually, you know, something that children really love and they're really interesting and they have strong social resonance and <laughs> they can be destructive in their own way. Yeah, it was good. Things like this. Yeah. It so. was nice. It was a rehabilitation of being called a <laughs> being dinosaur. Being a dinosaur, yes. I also remember that after the Tariq Ali talk, there was a contingent of, I believe, Indian visitors who had come not so much for Tariq Ali but for an Indian professor, which mm. is not a noteworthy thing, by the way, but to this group it was. Mm. And they all wanted to take selfies with him. And this was like a like a whole like business delegation and how much Terry Kelly seemed not to want to take <laughs> selfies with them. That was pretty funny. <laughs> okay, you and I went to a Slava Zizek talk mm -hmm. or seminar. And what was the thing that stood out to you about that? He was incredibly um, funny. And I thought that everything he said was just sort of like meandering and random until like the last 10 minutes and it wrapped up so beautifully and perfectly that i really understood it gave me a new perspective i think on his writing and his thought process and i'd never really seen that done in such a casual but intentional manner yeah two things that stood out about the Zizek talk one, the moderator for the panel was 45 minutes late and for some reason really didn't want to be there. And I thought that Zizek was going to be very mean to her, but he was actually quite polite about it. Oh, and, and that was the better, but that was the better response. And, and then it, the other thing that I thought was funny was that Zizek has a reputation for kind of hating his students or performatively mm -hmm. hating on students. Mm -hmm. And yet after the talk, he seemed perfectly willing and very comfortable. In fact, to be quite enjoying himself talking to students for yeah, quite a long time. Gracious. Um, mm -hmm. what I didn't like about it was that it was absolutely rehashed material to the max. There was not an original thing he said during the hour. <laughs> he, he always says this, I'm sorry if I'm going to repeat myself. <laughs> he says that like a million times. Okay, well, this was the intermission. We can do another <laughs> version of this at some point. Okay. Um, okay, so we're talking about like... We're um, talking about yeah. centrism. We're yeah, talking and about, about politics. The, the two doors, yeah. And the utopian element of politics, the utopian element which left us called the political, is precisely this not being able to formalize what something is. In other words, as soon as we've properly formalized what freedom is, as soon as we've properly formalized what equality is, it's not going to be free anymore or equal anymore. In fact, that's the difference between a totalitarian society and, and let's call it like a liberal society. A liberal society cannot decide what anything is or stands for. In a totalitarian society, everything stands for one thing, the people. <laughs> everything is the people in a weird way. And so what's, what's important to note is a couple of things here. One, Zizek draws a direct link, very formally direct, between the utopian element in politics and the utopian element within sexuality. Why? Well, as is true for most things, Zizek, you have to go back to Lacan. Lacan says, I was going to say it in French, but then I got embarrassed. <laughs> um, there is no sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's just il n'y a pas de sex. What is it? Il n'y a pas de something sexuel, something, something, something. Um, there is no sexual relationship. Now, what Lacan means by that isn't that people don't have sex. It's also not that people have good sex or bad sex. What Lacan means is that sexuality is the name of the very fact that the sexes are incompatible. Not incompatible because of biological determinism, because according to biological determinism, we're very compatible. Hard object, round object, etc. right? The whole point is that sexuality is the process of incompatibility. Mm -hmm. Sexuality is the process of not being able to properly, properly represent each other to each other, mm -hmm. which isn't to say that sexuality is bad, in a weird way, it's what makes sexuality utopian. If we could all agree exactly on what sex is, or what gender is for that matter, or what sexuality is for that matter, we would actually no longer have sexuality. Sexuality is precisely the process of trying to figure out what the heck we do with what happens down here mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. what happens here. And so we're actually back at the Freudian thing that, that we started with, which is the Freudian question is never, why does everything mean sex? The Freudian question is always, what does sex mean? How is sex filled in? And the properly sort of Marxist response to that is to say, well, sexuality is the part of no part. Sexuality is the place of no place. In other words, sexuality is the utopian element. 
as soon as we try to fill in sexuality with a determined stance, you will have lost that utopian element. In the same way that within the political, the whole pro point of having politics is that it's radically ontologically open. In other words, that we cannot define what we mean by humanity. This is also where we have to make the leap to ideology. As soon as we try to fill in this non-symbolizable substance with something like human rights or democracy, some universal master signifier that retroactively is supposed to infer meaning into all the other things we can't define, mm -hmm. that's ideology. Which is also why Zizek has always argued that the central lesson of the critique of ideology is not that ideology is um, that what we know is socially formed. In other words, that knowledge is a social construct. That's not the lesson of the critique of ideology. The lesson of the critique of ideology is that what we don't know is socially constructed. The questions we don't ask is socially constructed. The lives we don't value are socially constructed. The things that we cannot buy are socially constructed. The choices we cannot make are socially constructed. The critique of ideology is never simply the, cyn the cynical process of saying what you know is a construct. This is what they say is the truth, but actually it's a government conspiracy. That's not the critique of ideology at all. The critique of ideology starts and ends with everything that is not known, everything that is not said, everything that is not done. You're not looking at what is the secret reason behind what is being said or done. You're always looking for what is not being said and done. This is also why the critique of capitalism can take on a right-wing cynical conspiratorial version or a left-wing emancipatory version. The right-wing conspiratorial version of the critique of capitalism is to say, oh, I'm not taking the vaccine because it's all big pharma. Whereas the left-wing position would be to say, well, what is the condition upon which we can have equal opportunity by which people could actually do something to benefit the public health? And if you're really upset about big pharma, why not do something about the price of insulin? Exactly. For and this instance. is where the left and the right sometimes have like this eerie overlap and yet they fundamentally disagree on the main aspect, which is that you could go to a dinner table party with somebody who's completely right wing and they would probably critique the military industrial complex. They would critique consumerism. Mm -hmm. They would critique, I don't know, all of these things and yet would be coming from a very different place. And so that's a really important distinction. The critique of ideology is not the critique of what we do. It's a critique of what we don't do. In other words, the way in which what we don't say, what we don't think, what we don't acknowledge, what we don't act upon is socially constructed. I think that's a really, really important point. And it can sometimes be difficult to see. And the parallel that I would draw is to say that it's also in the relationship with how things in society become moralized mm -hmm. or not subject to moral consideration. So, for example, it may now be, you know, eating meat or... Um, um, or eating f or fish is a moral issue, you know, with the relationship to animal welfare or uh, the environment or uh, hun or global hunger or all of these other issues. So our diet becomes an issue of moral questioning when maybe even 20 years ago, that wasn't the same frame of reference because it wasn't part of the discussion about, is it moral to eat meat? I mean, that question didn't have the same resonance that it has today because the framework or the framework for how we ask those questions has changed in society. Yes. I mean, the moralizing take can also <laughs> go the other way around. Yeah, for example, course. in the Reagan era, which is something which Trump also adopted, the general stance towards the anti-drug policy was to say, just say no, which means that we never actually talked about the reasons why people cannot say no. The circumstances under which socially it becomes almost impossible to say no. Mm -hmm. And so the whole don't say no has its own set of unspoken assumptions about what it means to have individual agency within a society, which is increasingly difficult when you live on the margins of said society. Um, but I agree with you about the moralizing aspect, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to address before we wrap up. And one of them has to do with a TikTok video. <laughs> I get a lot of ideas from TikTok. I enjoy TikTok a lot. <laughs> and there's a, there's a, there's a, I don't know, a content creator, influencer, who's a young uh, Arab woman. And uh, I forgot what her name is, but a young Arab woman who's very funny. Sort of a comedic account. And she had an observation that is a very, very good explanation 
of the, of the definition of melancholy and how it relates to Freudian drive. She said, you've probably heard the expression, um, live as if it were your last day. I've got like a fuzz in my mouth, sorry. <laughs> live as if it were your last day. Mm-hmm. And she said, that never really works for her because you can't really live as if it were your last day. I mean, the truth is that if you were living as if it were your last day, you'd be on the phone all day <laughs> telling people you're so sorry that you took their library book three years ago, you know what I mean? Like Doing a lot of paperwork. A lot of paperwork, etc. Mm-hmm. This is what I want to have. This mm-hmm. is who can come to my funeral, can't come to my funeral, etc. And so she said a much better way of having the live as if it were your last day is to live as if it were your loved one's last day. (laughs) It's very morbid, but also very funny to me, which is exactly, it's about imagining the death of your loved ones is more effective in terms of spurning you to action than imagining your own death. Mm -hmm. Because in a weird way, of course, you're not present for your own death. Whereas when other people die, as the philosopher sage Keanu Reeves once said, when other people die, the only thing that happens is that the people who are left behind miss them a lot. And so she says, if she wants to feel like, quote unquote, productive or to do something meaningful, she doesn't think about her own death. She thinks about the death of the people she cares about. Here we have pretty much the perfect, perfect description of the two sides of melancholy. Melancholy in the traditional understanding of melancholy is, which I also put in the ebook. Basically, this entire series is me proving everything I said in the ebook wrong, or at least like showing the other (laughs) side of it. Melancholy is when you're holding on to that which has been lost. In other words, you're not formalizing the loss. Let's say somebody breaks up with you, and instead of moving on in your life, you simply fall in love with your own pain. You romanticize and idealize your own suffering. And so in a weird way, you haven't actually let go of your partner because now you're just in love with the shadow of the partner. That's the traditional idea of melancholy, which is powerful. There's a flip side to that, which is something that Freud points out, Lacan points out, and of course, Zizek points out as well, which is that melancholy can also be the staging of the loss in anticipation of the loss. In other words, you have the thing or the person, and yet even though you are, let's say, in a committed, happy relationship, You imagine that person dying. You imagine that person leaving you. You become sad even though you're happy because in a weird way, you're psychologically anticipating the loss. In other words, you're treating the item as if it were already gone. Um, I'm not gonna make a full comparison here because we did that in the book, but this is also how the castration complex works. The castration complex is in a sense melancholic because it's still there, except you you act as if it weren't, (laughs) you know what I mean? But we're not gonna go into that. There's a whole class, whole hour that I did on that. And so what melancholy is, in a weird way, is melancholy is, again, the difference between desire and drive. Melancholy isn't to say, I want X that has been lost. Melancholy is to say, I have X, but I'm going to treat it as if it were already lost. And that's what we become melancholically attached to. Of course, this happens in the present. If you are melancholic in the present, you're not just saying, oh, I'm nostalgic for the past. Instead, what you're saying is, I'm going to treat the present as if it were already lost. In other words, I'm going to mourn a present that I never fully inhabited in the first place. And so we're revolving around a no place. And here's what's so funny. Melancholy is in that sense utopian. (laughs) Melancholy is specifically the localization of a void. Melancholy is the site of something which is not a site. The present is, of course, exactly this. The present is simply that which cannot be formalized. The present is either an anticipation of the future or a loss of the past. Of course, it is both. And so to be alive is to be someone who cannot inhabit that space. To fully inhabit your own life is technically impossible. Either you're acting in anticipation of the future or you're acting out of a sense of mourning for the past. Mm And the way in which you short circuit that problem is through melancholy. Melancholy is to say, instead of mourning the past or anticipating the future, now I'm going to mourn the future that has not yet taken place. (laughs) And there's a certain weird and strange surplus enjoyment that happens at that point, which is why we enjoy melancholy. 
In a sense, it's also why we become melancholic when seasons pass, when we go from like summer into fall, because we're more aware of that transition. Um, it's almost like that the the Modest Mouse album. It's only bad news. It's only good news if you like bad news. That's essentially what melancholy is. Melancholy is only good if you like feeling sad. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But it's something very human because the irony is that we experience our subjectivity, we experience our own selves, our individuality, very strongly, very directly in the process of melancholy. In other words, in anticipating the loss of something which we never had in the first place. That is the present. The present is simply that which you never had and yet whose loss you are already mourning. This also means that the present is a vanishing mediator. It doesn't exist in a proper symbolic function. The present only exists as the formalization of that which is already past and that which is about to begin. Now, this is also, finally, the concluding argument of this class. Why Zizek says that the Hegelian-Lacanian subject, the individual, is the vanishing mediator. In other words, if we go back to Bajot's idea of the localization of the void, it's not that the void is out there. It's not that the event is out there, that love happens and you jump into the void. Instead, in a very Kierkegaardian way, life is a sickness unto death, which is that the very fact that we don't inhabit ourselves, that we never feel comfortable, that we never feel like we're truly in our life, that we feel like we're somehow stuck between the like irrefutably gone past and the not yet begun future. That process is what it means to be alive. It's not a detraction from life. That is life. And so life suddenly presents itself as a distinctly utopian present, which is that life is that which cannot be properly lived. Life is, in a weird way, the process of realizing that you're always too late for your own funeral. <laughs> <laughs> or your own party, if you see what I mean. And, and that, of course, is what Freud then calls a Wiederholungszwang, the drive for repetition. Because if you're constantly missing your own self, your own inhabiting of your own life, it becomes a grasping that becomes a repetition. Everything that you do in your life becomes simply a repetition of feeling like you didn't quite get it. And so you go to the next thing. The next encounter, the next meal, the next job, the next what? Well, we're back at the rock song. It's about drive, it's about hunger, it's about power, etc. And so in a weird way, this is why for Freud, the death drive is also the life drive. Because the only way in which we experience life is in the impotence of trying to get a handhold on what life actually is. And so it flies by. And the irony is that we say that when you die, you see life flashing in front of your eyes. But that is life. Life is the process of seeing your death flashing in front of your eyes, as it were. They're simply the same thing, except formalized in a different perspective. And so the most important thing that I want to say here is that now you can hopefully start to understand why Zizek says that the Hegelian Lacanian subject is the vanishing mediator. And what we're going to do next week is we're going to explain what the Hegelian Lacanian subject is. On which note, we're going to wrap up this class. Thank you, gentlemen. Yep, Thank you, everybody, for watching. Yes. We're so grateful to have you joining us here from around mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. it makes us so happy. It is such an incredible pl privilege that we get to travel around in our magic school bus, our education mobile, <laughs> and have these classes. They're mm -hmm. so stimulating for us to teach. Um, thank you, Jenlene, for joining us. Yeah, of course. It's really nice for me that you're here because that way it feels like a, like a nice environment. And you enrich everything in my life. Aww. So, thank you guys so much. I just want to say that next week, December 1st, the audiobook version of my ebook is going to drop mm -hmm. on Patreon. So, if you'd like to download the audiobook, you can get that as part of a bundle with the ebook. The transcript of this class will also be made available for all of our Masterclass patrons. Um, and the transcript of last week's class was just posted this morning. I posted it. Um, you can also download the audio for every class. Plus, we're going to be recording a bonus discussion on Discord in five minutes. So you can join us on Discord for a five-minute bonus discussion, which we also upload as a podcast for our patrons. Most of all, we want to say thank you to our patrons for keeping these classes open access, mm -hmm. for financing us, for financing these classes. On behalf of everybody watching around the world, all of the students in our global <laughs> learning community, we want to say thank you. Um, we love you all, and we will see you next week.
Sounds good. Have a great week, everyone. See you guys.